In this video, I'll answer a viewer's questions on disease-modifying therapies for multiple sclerosis. Don't turn away, because that starts right now. Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. Today, I'm answering viewers' questions about disease-modifying therapies to treat multiple sclerosis. So let's jump in. Inga F. writes, Is there a DMT that you wouldn't recommend? And that's a tricky question. The answer is yes, and I want to explain a couple different situations where I would not recommend a given therapy. For starters, we want to place you on the most effective therapy that you're comfortable with. And I need to unpack that sentence because there's actually a lot of information in there. The most effective therapy, which means I'm not going to start the conversation with the least effective medicine available. I am not going to lead the discussion with first-line injections because, in my opinion, they're simply not effective enough. Now, for people listening to this video who are taking interferon beta products or taking Copaxone, I'm not telling you to throw your shots out and switch. I'm talking about a newly diagnosed patient that is about to embark on therapy or someone who has had breakthrough disease and needs to escalate their therapy. I am not starting that conversation discussing shots because I want to bring a more effective drug to the table. The second half of that sentence, the most effective drug you're comfortable with, involves being comfortable. And I'm asking you to take a therapy, not for a couple weeks or a couple months, but quite literally for years and decades. And it is therefore critically important that you are comfortable with the risk profile, that you are comfortable with the side effect profile, that you are comfortable with the tolerability. So I would not recommend a medicine that you are uncomfortable with. Simply put, it's going to ultimately fail and it's not a good journey to embark upon. Inga, thank you for your question. In summary, I am not bringing low efficacy drugs to the table because I don't think that they're adequate to control the disease, and I am not pushing a drug that you're uncomfortable with. Those are my parameters when saying no to a DMT. LAW writes, My question is about taking ibuprofen before Rebif, and is the excruciating pain experienced after injections considered breakthrough disease? That's not considered breakthrough disease. It's considered an injection reaction. Unfortunately, interferon products, when self-administered, can cause pain at the site of injection. That's not breakthrough MS disease, that's a simply a very unpleasant way of receiving the medicine. I'm sorry that you're going through that, and if it becomes too intolerable, it's actually a reason to consider changing medicines to something that doesn't cause that side effect. The next two questions are related. They're both asking about gelinia and risks of cardiovascular side effects. Dottie Hilt writes, is there any data that shows taking gelinia can cause heart problems like AFib? Daryl Martin writes, hi, how about gelinia for someone with a family history of heart attack, AFib, etc.? Should I be more concerned due to this? Great questions, guys, and thank you for asking. When someone takes gelinia the very first day, the drug binds to all the available receptors in the body, including receptors on the heart, and that can cause a drop in the heart rate of about 20%. This is called a first dose phenomenon because it quite literally only happens the very first day that you take it. There is a contraindication to starting gelinia if you've recently had a heart attack or a stroke in the last six months. But gelinia does not cause atrial fibrillation. And there's no increased concern if you've had a remote heart attack in the distant past or if you have a family history of heart disease. The drug simply doesn't create a problem in that situation. This next question is from Kitty Lane. I take Tecfidera. Does it lower my immune system and make me more likely to get sick from other things? The mechanism of Tecfidera does not involve immunosuppression. What we're trying to do with Tec is rather fascinating. We trick the cell into thinking that it's under oxidative stress, even though it's not. And that causes it to respond with a cascade of, of antioxidant love, which literally slows down MS machinery. It's pretty interesting. And it's not really supposed to involve immunosuppression. It turns out that about 20% of people that take Tecfidera have a side effect where it drops their white blood cell count. That's not considered the mechanism of action of the drug, but in that 20%, they would be considered slightly immunosuppressed. How do you sort this out? Simply check a white blood cell count with a differential while you're taking Tecfidera. 
And if the counts are low, then there's something to be concerned about and to discuss. If the counts are not low, it's rather reassuring. Thank you for the question. Our next question comes from Joel, who writes, What is the long-term outlook for Ocrevus? Is there a limit to the number of infusions? Great question, Joel. Ocrevus has been FDA approved for a little over two and a half years, and we have several years of clinical trial experience preceding that. We don't have decades upon decades of data to answer the question the way that I would ideally like. I will share that in the duration of the long-term extension in the clinical trials, so all the time that patients have been studied while on study in research, we have not seen a signal of downstream problems when people are on long-term. We have learned from the clinical trials that in a minority of patients, they'll drop their antibody levels. Now, there is a risk that in some patients with suppressed antibodies, they may have increased infections. And if we have a patient that's developing frequent urinary tract infections or upper respiratory tract infections, we certainly would take them off the medicine. When Ocrevus launched, there was a question mark in the air about the possibility of breast cancer. With 100,000 people treated for over two and a half years, we have not seen a breast cancer signal. But the take home here is the medicine, all things considered, is still relatively new. And it's important that we remain vigilant, monitoring and observing and surveying for risks of cancer or risks of infection or what have you. Thus far, we feel that it is a relatively safe medicine, but we remain vigilant as we learn about the medicine over these first several years. Stay tuned. Mary Burke asks, question, how should a patient get ready to start on Ocrevus? Should we see our primary care doc or have any blood work done? In preparation for Ocrevus, there's a couple things that I would like to keep in mind. If you haven't had an MRI of your brain recently, I would love to get a MRI before we start Ocrevus so that we have a baseline coming into this new therapy. I also think it's important to check a hepatitis panel to ensure that you haven't previously been exposed to hepatitis B because there's a small risk of reactivation of hepatitis B when using anti-B cell agents. I personally like to also check for tuberculosis in similar conditions so that we know whether or not we would place you at risk if we started Ocrevus. Now these laboratories can be checked or drawn in your MS clinic. They can be drawn by your primary care doctor. I feel that it's important that your neurologist review the results before starting you on the therapy. Shannon Lewis writes, when it comes to the JC virus, how do we contract that, especially with MS patients, have a weakened immune system compared to regular individuals? Well, Shannon, interestingly, people with MS do not have a weakened immune system. In fact, their immune system is overly active. Nonetheless, the question is, how do you contract the JC virus? And the honest answer in 2019 is, we don't know. We know that just over half of adults over the age of 30 have been exposed to the JC virus. We know that if you're antibody negative, meaning you've never been exposed to the virus, your annual risk of coming in contact with the virus is maybe around 5%. It's still an unanswered question, and it may be something that we get through breathing on somebody else, but we don't really know. And as such, we can't make recommendations for how you can protect yourself. I do not recommend avoiding crowded areas. I do not recommend wearing a mask. I want you to live your life more fully. Stay tuned as we learn more. Kelly asks, does Tysabri carry a cancer risk? I understand everyone is different, but I mean as a general risk. And the simple answer is no. It does not appear that Tysabri markedly increases the risk of cancer. Jazzy Tings writes, how long can you stay on Tysabri? I have been on Tysabri since 2015 and I am JC virus antibody positive and have been since 2017. Jazzy Tings is asking a great question. How long can you stay on Tysabri? The drug was invented to be taken for life. Really, it has everything to do with the risk benefit. If you're taking Tysabri and you're not having attacks, you're not having new spots on your MRI, and you're not progressing on disability on neurological examination, that's the first important mark. And we want to make sure that's true to continue on this particular therapy or any therapy for that matter. The risk portion has everything to do with the PML risk. And it's my strong opinion that there isn't a rule where you must stop Tysabri at a certain time point because of a given risk. I would rather educate the patient every three months on their individual risk. We can calculate that risk and I have videos on this channel where I share with you how to do that. And then we empower the individual taking Tysabri to decide, am I comfortable with that risk or am I not comfortable with that risk? As long as you are controlled in your disease, 
not having attacks, not having new spots, and you are comfortable with the risk profile, then in my opinion, we should keep on keeping on. And the last question today comes from Sarah Joseph, who writes, I just finished round one of Limtrata last week. When will I feel any different? That's a great question. Limtrata is a disease modifying therapy intended to slow down or prevent new attacks and new spots to delay or halt disability and hopefully create a durable disease control in the absence of retreatment. All that being said, it's not necessarily going to make you feel better. Very commonly, when people start any disease modifying therapy, they have an emotional expectation that they're going to feel better. And that's not really what these drugs are intended for or how they work. I sometimes use the analogy of a birth control pill. If you have three children and you start birth control, you still have three children. They don't go away. You're taking birth control to prevent an unplanned pregnancy, an unplanned future child. In a similar fashion, if you don't feel good because of MS and you start a disease modifying therapy, Limtrata or anything, you still have the same symptoms from MS. They don't necessarily melt away. We're taking Limtrata or another DMT to prevent future bad things from happening. And in fact, I would use the chronic baseline symptoms that bother you as a reminder to why you've taken the therapy. What questions do you have about disease modifying therapies with multiple sclerosis? Please leave them down in the comments section below. If you'd like to learn more about DMTs, check out this playlist right there. YouTube thinks that you would adore this video right there. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please consider doing so. Just click that circle right there. Until my next video or my next live stream, this is Aaron Boster saying thank you for learning about MS with me.